Competitive 40K Network presents Art of War. Art of War. Strategy and tactics. Discussions with the best players on the planet. On the planet. With your host, Paul Murphy, and expert coach, Nick Nanavati. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Art of War podcast. My name is Paul Murphy, your host. I'm joined by Nick Nanavati. Hello, hello, Paul. Always good to be back on the show. It's my favorite time of the week. And Vyasar Ganesan, how are you? I am excellent. How are you guys? Yeah, I mean, really not too bad. Thanks for joining us. This is part one of a two-part episode. In part one, we're going to be talking about list and you, how you've been doing, uh, been basically been smashing it with what is an old-time favorite now? This is Tyranids. Oh, yeah. I thought Tyranids got nerfed. What happened? Are they still good? Uh, pretty good, as long as you don't bring the mouse after. <laughs> we're going to be getting into it. And in part two, we'll be talking about some of the nitty gritty, about maybe some of the matchups, maybe talking about how to, to beat this thing and, and how to stay competitive as things start to evolve. And you figured it out. Would you mind just kind of running through your list with us? Well, first, tell us, you know, what, what you've been up to. You've been you, you obviously been doing pretty well. Where you've been playing? Where are you from? Yeah. So I am from Austin, Texas, born and raised, uh, representing the Emerald Dreams team. We play at an Emerald Tavern, our local gaming store. So really lovely place to sort of like modern after an old school British pub with plenty of like D&D flair and war gaming flair. And our, our war room is tiny, but our team is actually a pretty decent size. Um, and this is our uh, our first big, uh, big victory. I went 6-0 and at Lone Star Open this weekend, which I did not think was going to happen. This is my first time. I really started playing in GTs maybe last year with the Austin Open. That was my first ever really big event. Um, I remember. I remember meeting you at the Austin Open. You introduced yourself yeah, to me. Yeah. You're like, Brown Bauer over here it was so awesome. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I, I actually, I was so excited. I was going through the Lone Star Open and BCP and I was like, I wonder who do well at this. Let's see if you can get on for an interview. And then I was like, oh, Yasser. Yasser went 6-0. and Let's get this on. I was so excited oh man it was uh it was a thrill the game five was a stream game and so i was like oh cool i'm, just, I'm excited i just made it a stream i don't care what happens after this and then i won and i was like wait a minute wait a minute wait wait a minute <laughs> one was, more uh, to go keep an eye on the prize one step at a time that's how it goes yeah well tell, tell us about your list so i am running a patrol detachment of high fleet leviathan so as you probably know by now leviathan is the uh the big boogeyman in, in the in the Tyranids arsenal Focus on durability. Anything, right? Yes, focus on durability. Exactly. Anything that's a synapse creature or has the synapse keyword is going to have transhuman, basically. So an unmodified wound roll of one through three will always fail. Anything that's in synapse range but isn't necessarily a synapse creature, unmodified roll of one to two always fails. So if you're targeting a non-synapse creature with a strength 14 done, you still need a three to hit or a three to wound. So I'm running, you know, everyone's old favorite that they love to hate, the winged hive tyrant with the reaper of obliterax and adrenal glands. The adrenal glands are really clutch there because for one CP, you get to add D3 attacks to the model when he's swinging with five attacks that are already, you know, they don't bypass invul, they bypass pretty much everything else. Yeah, all, uh, all the other bypass, armor out there. Yeah, all the other armor and potentially spiking the eight mortals is really, really fun. Um, I think I had, I had him swing into Abaddon at one point during the tournament when six is uh, during the snap to comparative where six is explode in melee. And I got 11 mortals on Abaddon, which was. And that's with hitting on fours. And then he lived anyway. <laughs> no, he, no, he, he no, went no. down. He definitely yeah. went down. <laughs> um, so yeah, running that. And then I've got for my HQ slot. Aside from that, I've got the Neurothrope, uh, just to get the extra 3d6 to cast of two things. In a no four sword slot, I'm running a Tyranid Prime and, and some other unit zone tropes. Two blocks of Tyranid Warriors, one nine man with bone swords, adrenal glands, death spitters, and venom cannons. And just a little five man with siphon talons, death spitters, and a single barb strangler. I've got a unit of three Venom Thropes for the classic gotcha, you're fighting last. A uh, unit of two Carnifexes with Venom Cannons and, and Crushing Claws. One Carnifex with the same layout, just so I can, you know, mess around with deployment, do a strong side, weak side. And then the, I think if the Hive Tyrant's not the MVPs, it's definitely the Harpies in this list. Harpies been hit or miss for folks. Uh, I don't know if we want to... Uh kind of back this up in reverse order let's go ahead and talk about the harpy since you just mentioned them yeah is that they made it into a couple of lists did really well did not seem to be a main like element of many other successful lists though so how are they working for you so i'm running two harpies one with synapse and one with the four up in bowl the adaptive physiologies are pretty deep for 10 points i can give the model synapse uh for the other 25 i give the model the four up in bowl so the the Clutch thing there is that the synaptic imperative the zoanthropes provide is that any synapse model during the zoanthropes synaptic imperative that also happens to be a monster emanates that aura and it says, all right, monsters get a four up invul. So both of them coming in on, if I'm going second or on turn two or whatever I call the invul, 
both of them have that four up interval. One of them's got transhuman. For one CP, I give the other one transhuman. So it creates a frankly, frighteningly durable flyer. That's already at minus one to hit. The, one of them is transhuman. One's got the four up invul. Like they're they're pretty tough to take down. So even if turn one, even if I go first and they don't pick up a lot, chances are pretty good that at least one of them is going to make it to turn two. You're getting another turn out of them because of those things there, and they're in your opponent's deployment zone and pr- are yeah. threatening to explode on something or whatever. I mean, oh, absolutely. I think my I played against Black Legion for the very first time, the new Chaos Space Marine list. Uh, I never played against it before. He charged in with a Demon Prince. Failed to kill a harpy, and it de- and the har- I had never seen the harpy's close combat profile. Four attacks, strength uh, six, AP two, damage two. Turns out Demon Prince has toughness six. I did four wounds to the Demon Prince. That's pretty good. Are you? Do you find yourself using them mostly as disruption? Or are they really taking out high value targets? And I mean, like I know we talked about the Demon Prince, and and that that is probably unlikely the Demon Prince if it's charging in. Does it or is it not because of that transhuman is or the transhuman effect is just so powerful? Transhuman effect's really powerful. I got really lucky with some saves. And yeah, that was basically it. Just transhuman effect being so powerful and getting lucky with saves is enough to keep if it's enough to keep them alive. And what I saw just playing as many games as I did, if the harpies make it to turn three, that's the game. You know, that's, just, that's cool. Yeah. If they can't, if there's not a way they can deal with it, over three turns, that's 36 venom cannon shots. Did oh, so you, you find did yourself for the game? venom cannons, even though they oh, have yeah. a price hike? That it's they're still worth it. I mean, six strength nine shots, AP three. For damage, even going into four up invuls, even going into armor of contempt, even going into gray knights and tide of shadows in cover, I still was picking up terminators left and right. Yeah, it's going to ask is you know when you saw that if you made it to turn three with them that it was basically the game for you. Did you did you find yourself uh, res- like pulling pulling back with them or were they just always that go forward and and cause basically wreak havoc? The only match where I didn't play super aggressive with them was my very first one against Gene Sealer Cults. Gene Sealer Cults obviously blocked the movement of them with the ambush tokens and whatnot, but I got lucky. He went first, so we had to flip up everything, so everything was there. But e- even so, there was just a lot of massed firepower on his side of the board, and he went first. He brought a lot of units to my side of the table. He dropped a butt ton of Gene Stealers in my front line, so I had to do a strafing run and bomb them, keep one kind of back to that but i was still able to get one back there in his deployment zone and one sort of in the midboard putting pressure there so i don't want to get too deep into your matchups right now but look at your army overall like leviathan their whole shtick is that they have transhuman on their monsters and their synapse creature or their synapse creatures in general and then they have baby transhuman on everything else so you're taking a lot of synapse creatures right the harpy you've made synapse the tyrants are synapse all the warriors synapse zone throughups um and then you're basically just being really durable at your opponent. Is that the general premise of your army? Yes, uh, it's a durability game. It's uh, my my. I don't have screens, right? The venom throats aren't a screen; they're a utility thing. I have speed bumps, is what I like to call them. The carnifexes are my speed bumps. So any army I know that I want a good turn two play on, any army I know that I want to get into that I, that I know is going to be going first or is going to be just is going to be punishing on the first turn, I try to put the Carnifexes in front or I try to put the Carnifexes in positions where they have to deal with them first before they can get to the rest of my army. Um, because the Carnifex, I think the Carnifex might be one of the best data sheets in the game. I'm just going to be honest. Ooh, it is that's, such that's, a, let's, that's let's, a let's hot take. That. Let's figure out why. What's going on there? So for 100 points, just baseline Carnifex, you get a T7 monster with a two-up save that's reducing all incoming damage by one. Okay, that means that reliably, in order to kill it at that over a melta, like two meltas need to go in, it, and that's good melta range. Good melta range, you're getting max damage. That's eight wounds going to six. You need a second melta just to get through and finish the job. And that's and that's AP four puts me at a six up save. Even without an invul, I still have a chance of saving here. Now you add heavy, cru- you add the crushing claws. This is where things like in melee we go to strength ten, AP three, D three plus three damage. So now we're a threat to armor. Three of those get through. Two of those get through. I'm picking up a character. Three of those get through. I'm picking up Lehman Russes. Um, it, it's it's a scary, scary profile of close combat. And strength 10 means I'm winning T5 targets on twos. And there's frankly, T5 has become the standard for a lot of infantry that we're seeing. So I knew that if something's going to charge in and it, if the Carnifex somehow lives, I want the swing back to be very, very hard. And then there's the Venom Cannon, right? Heavy Venom Cannon, Assault 3, which means I can advance and shoot and hit on fours. Um, since they're core, the, t- the Tyranid Prime can give a plus one to hit. So I can still advance and hit and head on threes. Leviathan saying that I can get to all the secondary trait for Leviathan, right? The adaptive being able to just re-roll a single hit roll. Huge deal when it comes to three shot weapons, right? Hitting on threes, statistically, I drop one. I get to re-roll it. Chances are pretty good that I get three through, which means when it comes to the wound step, chances are pretty good that I get two through. As opposed to dropping one and hits, dropping another one in wounds and only getting one through for four damage, I pick up the extra at eight. 
Not with en- with enhanced senses, the total <laughs> cost for one Carnifex comes to 145 points to make sure it hits on threes. Honestly. For 145 points, I get a unit that can move eight inches. It's a monster. It's core. It's T7, strength 10 in close combat, three shots at range, and it's a huge base. I can move block easy with it. I can hide stuff around it. I've been on the receiving end of Carnifexes. I was a non-believer. I'm a believer. The Carnifexes are, they're a legit data sheet. Like, no joke. Absolutely. I don't know about best in the game, but they are definitely in a conversation, like seriously competitive. Absolutely. Absolutely. When it, I'm going to Las Vegas teams in September, and I'm seriously thinking about bringing a 13 Carnifex list. Oh, my God. That's <laughs> actually one of the things epic. we'll get to in part two is is how many Carnifexes are enough. And is that, you know, would you yeah. be thinking about changing your list for in, in the ever-evolving meta? But we'll, we'll, we'll get there. Yeah. Uh, look, going in reverse order still, these Venom Threats. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned that, you know, that's that's the, the gotcha. But how do you deploy them I mean, or employ them, as the case may be, yeah. uh, to make sure you get a mo- maximum effectiveness? Let me, let me just also ask a follow-up yeah. question on that, because I think a lot of people look at Venom Throbs, myself included, and I think, all right, they're here for minus one to hit Aura. And sure. you you definitely jumped to the gotcha, was it no fallback? Like, clearly you got a more aggressive use for them, so I'm really curious yeah. about this. I, I try to keep them fairly close to the front for melee, because yeah, as soon as someone gets within three inches of them at the start of the fight phase, on a three up, they take a mortal wound and they fight last. Now, I think that I can count the total times that happened in this tournament on not even one hand, on half of a hand. It barely <laughs> happened. But it's enough of a deterrent that people are going to want to stay away from them. And they, they, they mess with people's target priority because they want people want to shoot the warriors. The warriors are such a key threat to deal with. Everyone knows the tiered well, warriors. If you never start, you never get through them all, essentially. So exactly. that's the value proposition that players are making on the other side exactly. of the table from you. Right. So hitting them on fours is really bad. So the, the smart thing to do, what most players weren't doing, though, is shooting at the Venom Throbs. I'm not saying most players are idiots. I'm just saying it's, it, it's a confusing target priority, right? There's two units that you can see, Venom Throbs and Warriors. What should you shoot at? Do you shoot at the one that is going to win the game in the long term? Or do you shoot at the thing that is making killing them harder? Because they're T5, four wounds each with a four-up save. They're not giving themselves minus one that you hit. So you could be wasting a ton of shots into them. And it's a it's a high risk proposition with the potential to not necessarily give you a high reward either. So it ends up it ends up mattering. And like their attack profile is nothing to sneeze at. Hitting on like fifteen attacks out of unit of three, always wounding on twos. So was the whole army always trying to stay within six of the Venanthropes to create this target confusion and all army minus one to hit maximization? Were you ever concerned about keeping the Venanthropes out of line of sight to try to protect them because you valued them so highly? How are you positioning them? It's matchup dependent. If I know my, if I know I'm going into a lot of shooting that can take down the Venanthropes, I'll hide them so that they, they, they just don't have a chance. They're going to have to shoot into warriors. And that's a tough proposition to deal with because they know they're, I know they're not going to pick up a whole unit of warriors in one turn of shooting. It's only happened, I think, even against like, Fully buffed, exploding sixes, chaos knights. They still didn't pick up the full nine unit of warriors. I think really it's it, it comes down to matchup defense. If like if I if I know that there's a high chance that they they really are going to pick up the venom ropes, I'll try to keep them out of the line of sight. But otherwise, they can be exposed, and I really don't mind. Charge into them. Go ahead. You know, let's see if you fight first or if I fight. Right. Uh, right. I dig it. I like that you've got. You know what are what is it for up to five or six incredibly powerful distraction bases? Yeah. Well, it's also it's, your army as a whole is like this unstoppable wall. Like everything is damaging in melee. Everything is damaging in shooting. Everything is coming at you as this giant wall of meat. And mm-hmm. there's harpies. Like you're just gonna shoot those. You can ignore those. That's happening to you. And there's mm-hmm. a tyrant. That's also so hard to deal with. I can absolutely understand how this could threat overload somebody. Is, yeah. Going back to the harpies too, uh, the best, the really the secret, the secret tech with the harpies is the spore mines. You don't always have to do a bombing run with them. Dropping three spore mines in on the table, if they don't shoot them, I got seven mortal wounds on the librarian in my stream game and just just picked them up. Like <laughs> that was it. That's well. Now, let's That's talk right. about these big old block of warriors. Is yeah. well, I mean, you have two two fat stacks of warriors that that take up. You know, I guess what size bases do you have them on? That's a good question. But they <laughs> they take up a ton of real estate. Do you play them on the forties, the fifties? I play them on. I think I, th- I have them on forties. I have them on forties. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I know there's some contention or confusion because I, who I actually have no idea what they're supposed to be on. I know. Uh, I think they come with 50s now, but they were originally released on 40s. Yeah, that might be. I it. think. I think. I, no, in that case, sorry, I do play them on 50s. My bad. I was thinking about it. I was like, wait, 
I have Space Marines on some. I have some Space Marine characters that are on forties, and their bases aren't that big. No, it's <laughs> definitely it's definitely fifties. I definitely have the newer kits. They're on fifties for sure. Cool, cool. Just wanted to, to check because I honestly didn't know. But please well, it, continue. What, what does when you're looking across do? the table, it can be intimidating. It's like that unit is everywhere. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the swar- It's the long, long line of conga line of death over there. So my biggest contention with warriors is I, I do not like how most tiered players run them in MSU squads because to me. That smacks of marine thinking. And Tyranids are not a marine army. Um, Tyranids historically always have tra- have won games by trading their bodies for points. Whether it's Gaunt Carpet, whether it's swarms of rippers swarming an objective that someone else can't do anything about, we trade our bodies for points. So I like running big nine-man bricks for that reason, because it means I got more bodies to trade into you. Yes, it means I lose out on more action monkeys, but let's get real here. I'm not taking action secondaries. I'm taking kill secondaries. This is an army designed to do one thing kill more than you to the point where you can't do anything about it. Now, that's really what the goal of building the nine-man brick is, because it means I don't have to split up my buffs between squads of warriors. I can pick the nine-man and say, all right, plus one to hit. Now a bunch of warriors hitting on twos, that's a problem. Reroll once to hit. Now hitting on twos, rerolling ones. Reroll once to wound. It just, like, the more buffs that get stacked on them, the more potential they have to explode I, and really cause problems. I do love that value town of basically having a vehicle for some quality stratagems or, or, or buffs. Mm-hmm. Did you find at all that um, there were some armies that maybe you didn't want to play against or maybe that you did play against that posed the challenge of, I'm so destructive, I will kill you anyway? Or was that not a real damage threshold you encountered? I was I was a little nervous about running into Eldar because I, I, I do not have enough play experience against him. Honestly, that was my biggest thing is not is not being worried about not being able to kill stuff, but sort of fear of player knowledge. I get in maybe three or four games a month if I'm lucky. I go to maybe one or two tournaments every other month. I'd love to highlight that as well. Yeah, sir. Yeah. Because I think a lot of people, I do, I do warm coaching and professional coaching. So I've, I've seen and experienced so many people in the Warhammer sphere, and very few, few of them actually get to play a high repetitious number of games. Like most people might get a game in a week, every other week, couple of months. That's pretty common. And yeah. to see you be able to go six and zero at a super major with that amount of games, I think that's really inspiring to a lot of people. Yeah, if I can do it, you can do it too, y'all. The dream is alive. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it's, it was really just like, I, I never, I hadn't played against Gene Steeler Colts in two years. And that was my first matchup. And I was, I was pretty, I was sweating. Like I had a Jersey on, he has a, he gave me his business card for his podcast. He's this older dude. He's there. Like, I was like, okay, all right, this is a cool, he's a cool dude. I was, I was just nervous. I, I, I love just, it. I love yeah. the t- a spirit going into the game uh, yeah. and, and, and playing with it, uh, playing with an army like Gene Steeler Colts and then also being sounded like aggressive with the actual Gene Steelers. Cause you know, you know what stats on Gene Steelers are. Everyone oh, yeah. kind of gets the sweats when they, when they start, uh, you know, figuring out that those things are very close to you. Oh yeah. And uh, it was, I'm still a little miffed that Gene Steeler cult Gene Steelers are better than Tier to Gene Steelers, but that's a it's separate in the name, issue. man. Come on. It's in the name. I know. I should, should be. be. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. Um, and then it was the same thing with Chaos Knights, right? I was just super afraid. Like I, I my only I, I asked my friends questions is to just stay away from the Terminators, just stay away from the whole army for as long as you can. And so that's what I did. I played as slow as I could and and because I was just like, I need to I fed them units to see what they could do. I was like, okay. Here's a Carnifex. Let's see what happens when he fights the Carnifex. Okay, that's what happens. <laughs> so it was just a lot of what's going to happen. How do I play? Learning this? on the fly. Yeah, learning. Lear, exactly, learning on the fly. How which, do you do that? Like we we often get so lost in the sauce on this podcast with list and how the list works and the choices. Well, you know, the, yeah. there's a, the pilot matters here, and for someone who plays yeah. as infinitely as you just put up the results, that's truly impressive. So how do you actually approach learning on the fly in 40k? It's yeah, it's a challenge. I think. I try to ask a lot of questions. It's it's hard when you only have 10 minutes to get started before the, the clock really, really kicks in. But I try, to, I try to keep asking questions as the game goes on. I try to reiterate, okay, that ability they have, is that coming from the chaplain? Is that a psychic power? I try to read, okay, what blessing do they have? What mark do they have? And that gives them a buff. I try to keep going over. And I've been fortunate that my opponents do the same thing for me. And that, you know, it is, at its core, 40K is a beer and pretzels game. It's a co- casual, conversational game. And having that good casual co- Cooperative, very cooperative yeah, game. Yeah, exactly. Because I, I want to be open and honest with my opponent. I want them to do the best that they can do. I just hope that my best ends up being better. Um, and that's a great way to look at it. Yeah, that's that's really, like I, I truly how I try to approach it. Because that's how I have the most fun. When I know that everyone's performing at their highest level it's how i know that a this is a fun game and also b that like this is this is the way it's supposed to be done so with the learning on the fly it's really like okay i just got to keep keep asking questions keep internalizing it and sort of testing different things okay what if this what if that and then paying attention there was one turn 
where the, the um, hitting on fours and higher litany didn't go off. And I said, oh, this is my moment. This is my one chance to try to pick up as many terminators as I could. And I was like, this is also a testing moment, right? Because he still got off T5 on them. He still got off the five up feel no pain on them. So it's not an easy hill to climb, but it's going to be, it's easier than it's ever going to be in, next, in the next couple of turns. So that's when I just dumped, I had to try to dump everything into them and see what I could do. And even then it was still a learning moment because I didn't do as much as I thought I could. And I started realizing, okay, putting pressure on the characters may actually be more important than I first thought. And I got super lucky. I really like, I really truly think that going six and zero at this event is a lot coming down to dice, making a lot of saves that, I mean, the demon prince should have killed the harpy and he didn't. Well, you, I, you mentioned in luck a few times, and that's something actually to jump in, into, into the second episode or second part of the episode is sure, that, yeah. you know, no, 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 this is, it's great topics. I mean, it yeah. is that those moments of self-reflection are actually very important, uh, but I don't want to also take away from the fact that you were in the situation and you capitalized on, on the things as they unfolded and you have to actually still play the game, but we haven't even gotten through your HQs yet. Oh, so yeah. let's unpack Sorry. those HQs. Uh, <laughs> Conversations is, is a pretty so important. Exciting. Paul, I can't. Yeah, like, section can't of the away. army. Uh, then after the HQs, we'll probably take a break. Then we'll come back and start talking about some secondaries. Absolutely. So uh, going into HQs, uh, can I talk about the Neurothrope? Yeah, yeah. Dealer's choice. Yeah, he's the last three up invul we have left in the codex, which is not the reason you take him though. The reason you take him is the extra D6 for the casting. Zoanthropes get that plus three to cast and the plus three to mortals. So having a way to make sure you reliably get plus six to more like D six plus three is better than D three plus three. So right. having the three D six drop below, it's just better. And then giving him the warlord trait every single time it's worth the CP rather than spending the CP to reroll two D six. I'd rather get it right the first time. You know, I'd rather have the ability to put it on the zone tropes and the, the hive turn if I need to, or if I'm taking psychic interrogation, putting it on the neurothrope himself because he gets plus one to cast and three D six plus one is a great way to make sure that you're getting that command point back. Yeah, I think the Neurothrope is a staple I see in pretty much every single tier list. It's just so yeah. such value add. It's it it's it honestly it might give the Carnifex a run for their money in terms of just most efficiency for points because he is aggressively costed. I know you you noticed you also had a couple of units that don't take up force org slots. Come on, describe them a bit. Yeah, so I've got the Zoanthropes, which I love. Uh, I love the sculpts. I love. I just I think they're such. It's fun to just. Have brain bugs right I own the 15. They're all painted based, the, like the same yeah. scheme and everything. It's so cool to look at them all together. Nick, did you used to run the old zone throat bomb strat where you have them like, triangulating and do mortal wounds I in the middle? I've been playing Tyranid since 4th edition, Yasser. I, no. I, I, I haven't done it all. Oh my no. God. I used the psychic choir. That's my jam. Yeah. <laughs> it's so much fun, man. I remember when they had a Lance profile. Uh, but they are, they're surprisingly tough too. I would sometimes just leave them exposed on an objective to bait someone out into going into them. Um, like, it, and, and it, it worked, it paid off sometimes. Like I put them out of position and, and, you know, it, it baited the opponent in with them because they know they're a high value target. And even if one's left alive, it's still a pretty good smite target. And it's still a pretty, or it's a pretty good smite resource in that way. The other uh, non-force work slots, the Tyranid Prime, who is just a, a workhorse, a free Venom Cannon, guys. You can just take a Venom Cannon for free. D3 shots at strength 8, AP2 damage 2? Like, <laughs> come on. That's pretty good. It's pretty good. One of the On things I've of noticed that, with Leviathanless is they really just try to take as many Venom Cannons as they possibly can also. Oh, yeah. Like, other warriors take it, their monsters take it. And just divide by Venom Cannon. Yeah, that's really really what the list should be called, is divide by Venom Cannon. <laughs> he already gives reroll once to wound. I thought it would be cute to give him the direct guidance warlord trait, which lets me pick a core character within or a core unit within uh, Synapse Link range or six inches to give plus one to hit, because two buffs are better than one. And again, plus one to hit, you know, it's worth the CP every time, better than spending a CP to reroll something. So it ends up that I get to give out plus one to hit to something, reroll one to wound to something, reroll one to uh, reroll one to hit to something, and then two units, two psycho units get to reroll an extra roll an extra three six to cast. So it ends up being a pretty sizable stack of buffs in the command phase. But there have been, I guess there has been some debate about whether or not you take the Hive Tyrant and what you put on the Hive Tyrant mm -hmm. uh, as far as, I mean, I guess maybe you do want a Hive Tyrant, but how the, the Hive Tyrant makes an appearance has been in debate. Can you tell us how you landed on this this choice? So originally when the when Nephilim came out, I was running two detachments. I was running a Walking Tyrant and a Winged Tyrant. And I realized, you know, well, now that Nephilim came out, I was just like, there's no way I can run a game with zero CP to start. There's just no way. It is not a good look. It's not a good feeling. And I wasn't sold on the Reaper initially. Initially, I was more sold on Shard Gullet uh, because of who doesn't want a strength 12 damage five gun <laughs> on a model that hits on twos? That seems I'm, good. Seems real good. There's a lot of value that can come out of that thing. But 
I actually played against at War Games Con. I played against one of my friends who was running Tyranids, and he ran the he ran the Reaper, and I saw what it can do on a properly built Hive Tyrant. And I decided, okay, all right, it's time. I've got I've got a, I've got the kit. Let's put it together. And uh, he he has surpassed my wildest dreams. Truly, I think the everyone agrees Winged Hive Tyrant with Reaper is good. The disagreement comes really on the um, the Warlord trait that you give him. People seem to think that the perfectly adapted warlord trait is a good one, and it's it is like you get to you get a free reroll on one thing, on a psychic test, a charge roll, a hit roll, a wound roll, and that's great. But he already comes with the prehensile pincer tail and the lash whip, both of which give you some reroll flexibility in both of those things. So you're just shoring up the same thing already. What he doesn't have is a feel no pain, and that's where adaptive physiology as a warlord trait for me really comes in, because catalyst is the only other way we get a feel five of feel no pain, and it's just not. Psychic powers aren't reliable anymore. We I, live in a Grey Knights and Thousand Suns world. For what it's worth, I completely agree with you. It also allows you to put Catalyst on your warriors while he's just right. also being all pained. But for, yeah. as it, from the opponent's perspective is just where I want to come from it. I look at the Flyrant, and I see this monster that kills whatever it touches. And you give it a Warlord trait that helps it kill whatever it touches. Not, nothing changed from my perspective. When you give it feel no pain, I'm like, this thing's unkillable too. It is a big flying brick that you just have to deal with. And with the, the overrun stratagem, I think on one game I overrun four times and I zipped around to every single table quarter, just picking up units wherever he went. It was incredible. That's, um, that's amazing. Yeah, let's, let's take a quick break. Then we'll come back and talk about some secondaries and then we'll talk about some uh, CP. Like what you're listening to? Be sure to check out the second part of this episode where we break down specifically how our guest plays against all the top armies in the game. Want even more awesome Warhammer content? Check out the War Room. The War Room. You'll gain access to the minds of the best Warhammer players in the world with brand new content every single week. Join our amazing community, elevate your game, and enjoy your hobby more. Hey everybody, we are back talking Tyranids. Tyranid time. Tyranid time. So I thought that the time for Tyranids had passed, but it is Tyranid o'clock. It is straight up Tyranid o'clock. Tyranid time is my favorite time of the day, and I love asking questions to the big brain bugs. So <laughs> one of the challenges to Tyranids these days is that they kind of got their secondaries nerfed because the whole game did, and... Uh, Factions have been adapting by switching more and more into their codex-specific secondaries. Tyranids, they leave a little bit to be desired in the codex-specific secondary department. So yeah. what secondaries do you actually use in your games? I'm a big fan of No Prisoners. No Prisoners got way better, and I have an army that can table my opponent. Um, most of the practice games that I had to this, they weren't many, but and the, and I did go to a practice RTT where I was regularly tabling opponents. And No Prisoners... It is a pretty spicy objective. Terminator's giving up three wounds, big, you know, cultist blocks. There's a lot of value in no prisoners now. And I definitely try to take as much advantage as possible, especially with, you know, people wanting to bring back Terminators or, or uh, Necrons coming back in hordes. It, it's great. Yeah, I don't care if you reanimate. Please reanimate. Feed my no prisoners points. Uh, still a pretty solid one to take. Banners, I have become more fond of as well, especially with the changes, because it seems now that you know, I can raise the banner even as long as I control it, even if an enemy's on it. That's that's still some good value because a unit of Tyranid Warriors raising a banner is still a unit of Tyranid Warriors at the end of the day. It's going to be hard to shift. You're really going to have to work in picking them up just to take down one banner giving me one victory point. To get through uh, them to, and then to the objective, I mean, you have a lot of manipulation there. I think you can do influence. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I usually was taking one of those two. Psychic Interrogation I, I was also a good one if I wasn't taking one of them or, or if I needed a Psychic Secondary. Um, I'm a big fan of it, and the Neurothrope just makes it so easy, or at least get a good good chance of getting that CP every turn. A lot of players uh, typically go for Psychic or Warp Ritual over Psychic Interrogation, because it's you, you only have to do it for three turns instead of five, and your opponent doesn't have any play around it, aside from maybe denying it. And your right. army is probably in the center of the board, I imagine, so that shouldn't be too challenging for you. Why Psychic Interrogation instead? Because the center is a trap, Nick. Is play. That's what I like to hear. That's see. <laughs> now we know that's the war room right there. Yeah, the center. The center is a trap. The center is for people who take oath of the moment. The center. The center is for people who want to play the scouring just as the middle game objective. The the center is always a trap, and I, I've fallen for it way too many times, and I'm sick of it. I'm sick of falling for traps. I just want to pick one side of the table and move over there. If you don't, 
you don't like this big U-Haul bus of bugs moving to one side of the table. There's a whole other side of the table to move to. Go over there. So yeah. well, well, that's an interesting approach to the game. A lot of people try to take the center. That's board control over the table, easiest path to the most objectives. And you're saying, screw that plan. I'm just going to completely run a bus over the left half, uh, crush yeah. the left flank per se. So yeah. why, why that approach? What does that get you? Because I'm already trying to table them. Like, I, I have the tougher army. I have the army that will live longer, stay, stay alive longer, even if I can't bring anything back. I, like, I truly feel that the Carnifexes, the Harpies, like, very, very hard to shift kind of army. And if it's all going on one side, all it takes is a few key mistakes on my opponent's side, which they usually are going to make. They're going to deploy wrong because it's player place terrain, which very few people have had practice with. It's frontline gaming's terrain, which no disrespect, no disrespect to frontline gaming's, you put on one hell of a tournament. It's not the same terrain that people have at home. And it's not the same terrain that people have at game stores. And it's very, very easy to mess up terrain deployment. And it's very, very easy to assume that you're going second and misdeploy there. So that you're not in a good position to take the center, actually. You're not in a good position to deal with a unit that's just coming on one side. And it, it ends up working. Even if I'm messing up my own terrain, I'm still pushing on one side strong enough that they, they don't always have a way to deal with it. Plus the harpies getting in the backfield, you know, suddenly they have a choice to make, right? They have a choice to say, do I deal with the harpies and play my opponent's game or do I stick to my plan? And 90% of my opponents did not stick to their plan. 90% of the opponents tried to just take the harpy down. And for some of them, that meant staying in their deployment zone a little too long. Yeah, yeah, that disruption piece cannot go uh, basically unheralded. I mean, that's what yeah. we've seen players used to a lot of effect. And like you mentioned, you've made them slightly more tougher. You've planned for that and, and trying to extend that disruption basically half the game. And it's, it goes at a certain point, it goes from just disruption to disruption. I think on one turn, I destroyed 600 points of stuff and it was turn one. Like there, there is no, that's not a disruption piece anymore. That's just, they're killing you. If you yeah. don't do something, they're just going to keep killing you. That's why the Harpies are so threatening, is that the mobility to get to line of sight to whatever they want, and then they actually the potency to kill whatever they shoot at. So it's, uh, mm -hmm. it's a problem you can't ignore. A lot of answers to Flyers are just like, weather them for a while, because it's not that powerful. Harpies are very powerful. They're very pricey, good. but like if you, how, how much is a Harpy these days? Well, so the way I'm building them, one is going to be 200-ish. Uh, yeah, one is 230, one's 215. Yeah, so we, all in all, so. that's 445 points of flyers. It's, it's not like, you know, these things can just get shot. It's, it is a yeah. real possibility. Now, Yasser, you've invested all of the points in defense pretty much across the board into your army to prevent that stuff, and which I think is totally the right move for this Leviathan-style build. Um, mm -hmm. but, I don't know, man. 20% of your points or whatever to, to tie up your opponent's 100% of their army for 50% of the game. Mm -hmm. I don't know. On paper, it seems like a good trade. No, I, yeah. I think uh, the Harpies are a great ad. I love it. Yeah, yeah and this is... I, want, I mean, people need to respect the Harpies, and but there's really nothing they... What the Harpies are coming their way. Uh, it's going to be up to them to almost like a stat check to whether or not they can bring them down in mm -hmm. a very efficient way. Were these harpies, because you can always play at different levels of aggression with them, were they hyper, hyper aggressive going into your opponent's deployment zone, bombing something, seeing something deep and getting hit by the entire army like that? Or were they were like some level below that in aggression? Where's the scale lie? Yeah, I think I always go deep. I always do the full 40 move or as close to 40 as I can get because I can pivot twice during the move. They're going to go anywhere they want. They're going to get there. And I, with a bombing run, I can drop spore mines wherever I want, or I can try to pick up a unit of 10 uh, if he's got one. And against Chosen, it's actually hilarious because, sure, they've got three wounds each. They're durable. But with the Harpies, that means I can keep making strafing runs over them and just keep getting to roll a lot of dice over the Chosen, picking them up slowly over time. And I, it comes down, I think the first turn is always really aggressive with the Harpies because the rest of the army can still set up and move into position to create that bus onto the one side of the table. Um, and the harpies can, you know, just have a party in the backfield and, and be that really, really big distraction. Turn one for the opponent then becomes, do I deal with the harpies in my backfield or do I get out and go? And if I'm going second, it's the same thing because the opponents now, you know, pushed out a little bit. They're usually, I didn't, I didn't give you a spot with... to land the harpies is what they've done. Exactly. That's what they've done. They've given me a spot to land the harpies, fly back there, park them and then see what they do. Nice. Very good. We're now to the command point section of the podcast where we talk about either these are some CPs that you spend, you know, you mentioned you, you didn't feel good going into the games with your CP reserve uh, that you were considering and then you landed on, you know, what you, what you did. Um, I guess we can talk about that before we get to the brutal and cunning segment. The brutal and cunning <laughs> is where we talk about a super combo that you do that you always try to save some C, CP for. Yeah. Yeah, with, with the CP, the command point changes with Nephilim. Yeah. Did that impact what you decided to run, or did you just go with it and let the let the CPs fall where they may? Yeah, it was really it was really hard. I think realizing that I was spending all these CP on warlord traits because that's where the bulk of them went. 
um, it was it was a hard thing. But I got a lot of value out of them, and I was fairly confident that I was going to get the CP back. There was only one mission at Lone Star Open where I wasn't getting the battle the battle round CP, the the, the battle forge CP at the start of the game. Because some missions are situational to where you have to have you to be doing something. Your warlord on the table, you had to be on yeah. a certain objective uh, or a certain space in the board to yeah. gain the, the command point. Exactly, but. I have psychic interrogation. I have uh, cranial feasting, which I took occasionally to get some Sounds CP gross. back. Yeah, it was. It was. It, I mean, I was. I was doing okay on CP in, in most places. I think really the main thing is if I'm going second, I knew I needed two CP at least for if they throw a big damage model or a big damage something into the warriors. I want those two CP for the reduced damage strat because on a unit of nine, it costs two and three wound models reducing. A, two damage weapon to a one damage weapon is so important reducing any, even a three damage to a two damage means it takes two damage dice for every turn and warrior um which is a super tall order when the when the venom throws are nearby super tall order when they're transhuman just they're impossible to shift two cp to make sure they're even more impossible is important too um if they're not going into the turn and warriors i need to make sure i have at least one for the harpies because that's usually what they're going into um so that i can give one of them transhuman so that turn one if i've got the four up and i've got the four up invul snap to comparative the uh, extra cp is there just to make sure you know they've got both of them have transhuman and the four up invul i like that cp plan you start with one you said or zero i'm starting with two so the old two? list i was yeah, yeah the old yeah. list i was running was starting with zero which was just real real feels bad moments um yeah come on you, you didn't get one back maybe yeah, exactly. I was going to like, come on, why own any of this back? Um, but psychic interrogation is great for that, right? Psychic interrogation really helps. Uh, just it pays its weight in gold uh, over the course of the game. When do you get the CP on psychic interrogation? What do you have to roll? So I have to beat their leadership on the psychic test. But a neuro casting it is very three six dropping the lowest plus one. Yeah. Yeah. That's nifty. I haven't, I hadn't considered that element as like interrogation being quite valuable because I looked at that. I was like, when's this going to happen? But yeah, well, you know. <laughs> It's why I prefer it over Warp Ritual, too. That and, like, you get to score 15 instead of 12. I'll take that. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. Do you find yeah. your... I guess the Harpies really open up your ability to score turn one. Oh, yeah, for sure. I can really... I mean, putting pressure on that means they're not putting pressure anywhere else. The, the Neurothrope can advance up the table, get within 24, and, and start going to town there. Very well. Also, the Harpy... One of the Harpies having Synapse means it also has Shadow in the Warp, which, against, you know, any Psychic-focused army, suddenly they're at minus one to cast. So can't let me, be relevant. Let me yeah. ask you this one more. Um, is there anything you wish you you had that you didn't? Any any players that didn't partic- particularly do too well? I know you went six and zero, so it's hard to critique like that. But there's always room for improvement, you know. There for sure there is for sure. I think there is there is an argument to be made for just taking one harpy, freeing up another two hundred points. That was to take not a, like, where I thought that was your answer was going to be. Really, I, you yeah. the whole show has been like the harpies are awesome you know and you're like let me cut one i just because they they, sometimes it ends up not being overkill necessarily but just it's a lot of points and he's got his mind on 13 carnifexes man those points gotta come that's that's really what (laughs) it is 230 points i can win two more carnifexes man (laughs) i guess i mean i think we have our answer for mvp yeah it's the best data sheet in the world carnifex Find find me a dreadnought model that's that cost effective, and I'll and I'll. I don't conceive. like dreadnoughts either. That is not the comparison I was going for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think maybe there's an argument to be made too for splitting up the unit of warriors into three units of three, just to have more action play. It changes my secondary game a lot uh, if I if I have units that can do actions, but it also changes my kill potential with them too. Cranial feasting has to be scored in melee, and the tiered warriors, aside from the the, the hive tyrant. Tyranid warriors are doing the scoring in melee, so like that's it, it's a it's a great way to guarantee cranial feasting as opposed to okay, I guess I'm just going to try these action objectives. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. So then, what is your super combo? What do you save command points for? What do you build oh. towards? Uh, if you since you're only starting at two, uh, that, that is, you feel like if you just get this off or engineer the situation, that yeah. you got a much better shot in this game. I try to I try to focus on the two CP swing. One CP. I know we I know the economy is rough right now at CP, but I really try to hold on to two CP swings as much as I can. With the Hive Tyrant, it's Adrenal Surge and Voracious Appetite. Extra D3 attacks, rerolling all wounds. Even at Strength 11, there are things I'm wounding on threes or something that gets minus one to wound. I'm going to wound it on threes or fours. So how just roll bad. It's nice little insurance. Yeah, you can just you can always roll bad. And even on a Carnifex with five attacks hitting wounding on twos, it, spending a CP on Voracious Appetite there is still pretty good um, to make sure they convert, to make sure they that everything connects. For the Tyranid Warriors, the two CP is really valuable for that, that minus one damage strat, but 
the adrenal gland ability that the Tyranid Warrior has is also what they have. And they get, and instead of getting an extra D3 attacks, they all get one extra attack. So double bone sorted Tyranid Warriors are getting five attacks each. On a unit nine, that becomes 45 attacks. Yeah, it's a lot of attacks. It can, it can Strength eight, AP2 damage. Yeah, it's, uh, it can get rough really fast with them. Um, oh, that's nice. That's yeah, a, yeah good, good choices there, I think. So let's talk, I guess, before we wrap this up, about the, uh, the biomorphologies change. Mm. Now, do you run just the the standard? I, what is it? The what's the name of uh, of just the the standard trait? Oh, yeah, the standard Leviathan trait is the uh, reroll. Just reroll a single hit roll. Yeah, that's the one I stick with. If I was running Jormungandr, I'd be running the Territorial Instincts, the one that's just lurk. You just you get to have monsters with obsec, which is hilarious for the thirteen. Lurks are good. Field. Good one to have is what it oh, seems yeah. like. Yeah. Yeah. If you well, don't all, have lurk, well, actually, for your thirteen card effects, are you are you going Leviathan still? Or are you switching over to obsec world? I'm not sure. I'm still playing around. I, I, the list I have built is Jormungandr because thirteen obsec card effects. Is, is amazing and just really funny to watch. Like, I, like the priority then becomes, okay, destroy all my opponent's obsec infantry and then just laugh after that <laughs> um, and watch his Carnifex is outscore everything else. And on the mission where the, you get to plant bombs and if it's an obsec model that plants the bomb, it completes them in the turn. Just Carnifex is taking a big explosive dookie on my opponent's half of the table and finishing it that turn is just... Chef's kiss. You know? <laughs> yeah. I, I think that image is is all I need from this show. <laughs> oh, is there anything else you want to add? Pictures yes, with words here. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if you've ever had an episode this vivid. I can I can see through the <laughs> the audio file. <laughs> My goodness. So you felt like Tyrion is still able to hang out there, obviously, yeah. you know, in, in in the world. I know you've mentioned some some things like Thousand Suns and Grey, and Grey Knights. What was your path to victory, if you can remember? I know sometimes, yeah. the, you know, the games, if they, you know, the, you feel like, man, was that this tournament or last tournament? <laughs> One of my teammates actually made me a very handy binder with mat layouts and everything. And the man, old my teammates suck. Like I need to get them on this. <laughs> well, <prepared> this? <laughs> so my pairings, my pairings, I went to Gene Steeler Colts round one uh, and then round two. I went into um oh it was it was custodies some good old good old custodies round three still I good went too. still also still very very good um just not against Carnifex is reducing their strength damage shoe weapons and then round three was chaos knights for the first or uh, chaos marines excuse me for the first turn uh, round four I had orcs who I hadn't played in a while as well then round five gray knights and finally round six black legion again against the man himself Russell Tassin. Very nice. Well, well done, and congratulations on 6-0 and at the Lone Star Thanks. Super Major. Very impressive, Yasser. Thanks. Appreciate yeah, it. Not an easy path with some tough opponents. Thanks for coming on and talking talking to us about your list and your matchups. I want to remind folks, this is part one of a two-part episode, so hang out. If you're a subscriber, you will get access to part two. If you're not, and this is you, know, you, you come to the end of this part of the show, please do not forget to leave us a five-star review. Like, share, subscribe, leave some comments. That, that is you know, really a good way to interact with the show that helps other people find us as well to maybe come on and talk about their experiences so you learn more about what's happening out there. But yeah, sir, it's been a pleasure. Nick, also always a pleasure. You too, Paul. Yeah, seriously, this was a lot of fun. I admire you guys so much. It's a, it's a real pleasure getting to be here with y'all. Thanks so uh, much. Thank you. It means a lot. We'll see y'all soon. Like what you just listened to? Check out Art of War Down Under and Art of War Unbroken on the competitive 40K network. The Art of War 40K.com. <laughs>